It was a dark and stormy night when Jake and his friends decided to explore the abandoned house on the hill. They had heard rumors that the house was haunted by the ghosts of a family that had died there in a fire. Jake didn't believe in ghosts, but he wanted to impress his crush, Lisa, who was part of the group. They parked their car at the foot of the hill and walked up the winding road. The house loomed over them, a sinister silhouette against the lightning flashes. The windows were boarded up, the door was locked, and the paint was peeling off. Jake found a crowbar in the trunk of his car and pried open the door. He pushed it open and stepped inside, followed by Lisa and the others. The house was dark and dusty, filled with cobwebs and broken furniture. Jake shone his flashlight around, looking for anything interesting. He saw a staircase leading to the upper floor, a fireplace in the living room, and a door to the basement. He decided to check out the basement first, hoping to find something scary. He opened the door and walked down the wooden stairs, creaking with every step. He reached the bottom and saw a large room with a dirt floor and stone walls. There were shelves along the walls, holding jars of various shapes and sizes. Jake walked over to one of the shelves and picked up a jar. He looked inside and gasped. The jar contained a human head, floating in a green liquid. The head had a twisted expression of pain and terror, and its eyes were wide open, staring at Jake. Jake dropped the jar and screamed, shattering the glass and spilling the liquid. He heard a loud thud behind him and turned around. He saw the door slam shut, trapping him in the basement. He ran to the door and tried to open it, but it was locked. He banged on the door, shouting for help. Guys, let me out. This is not funny. He heard no response, only silence. He felt a cold breeze on his neck and turned around. He saw a shadowy figure standing in the corner of the room, holding a bloody axe. The figure moved towards him, slowly and silently. Jake recognized the face of the head in the jar. It was the face of the father of the family that had died in the fire. The figure raised the axe and swung it at Jake, who screamed in horror. Meanwhile, Lisa and the others were waiting for Jake in the living room. They heard his scream from the basement and wondered what was going on. Did you hear that? Lisa asked, worried. Maybe he found something scary, one of the boys said, laughing. Or maybe he's just trying to scare us, another boy said. Let's go see what he's up to, Lisa said, grabbing her flashlight. She walked to the basement door and tried to open it, but it was locked. She knocked on the door and called out Jake's name. Jake, are you okay? What's going on? She heard no answer, only silence. She felt the chill run down her spine and a sense of dread in her stomach. Guys, something's wrong. The door is locked and Jake's not answering. Maybe he's playing a prank on us, one of the boys said. Or maybe he's in trouble, Lisa said. She looked around and saw a fireplace poker lying on the floor. She picked it up and used it to break the lock on the door. She opened the door and walked down the stairs, followed by the others. They reached the bottom and saw a horrifying sight. Jake's body was lying on the floor, covered in blood. His head was missing, and a bloody axe was next to him. The jar that contained the head was broken, and the liquid was spilled all over. The head itself was nowhere to be seen. Lisa screamed and dropped her flashlight. The others also screamed and ran back up the stairs, trying to escape. But as they reached the top, they saw another shadowy figure standing in front of them blocking their way. The figure was holding a knife and had a wicked smile on its face. Lisa recognized the face of the head in the jar. It was the face of the mother of the family that had died in the fire. Hi guys, thank the you so figure much stabbed one of the boys in the chest, the horse, making him fall to the ground. The others tried so to run past the, the figure, but it was too fast and agile. It slashed and stabbed them one by one until they were all dead. The figure then dragged their bodies to the basement and piled them up next to Jake's body. It then picked up the head in the jar and placed it on top of the pile. It whispered something in the head's ear, and the head nodded. 
The figure smiled and kissed the head, then walked away, leaving the house with the knife. All right, I will try to finish the story in this message. Here is the final part. The next day, the police arrived at the house on the hill. After receiving a call from a neighbor who had heard screams and seen lights in the house, they entered the house and searched for any signs of life. They found nothing on the ground floor except for some blood stains and broken glass. They went to the basement and saw a gruesome scene. There were six bodies lying on the floor, mutilated and decapitated. On top of them, there was a jar with a human head inside. The head had a smile on its face, and its eyes were open, staring at the police. The police were shocked and horrified by what they saw. They called for backup and forensic experts. They tried to identify the victims and the head, but they had no luck. The victims had no identification on them, and their fingerprints and DNA did not match any records. The head also had no match, and the jar had no label or date. The police were baffled by the mystery. Who were these people, and why were they killed? Who was the head, and how did it end up in the jar? And most importantly, who was the killer, and where did they go? The police never found the answers to these questions. The case remained unsolved, and the house remained abandoned. The only clue they had was a knife that was found near the house, with blood and fingerprints on it. The blood matched the victims, but the fingerprints did not. The fingerprints belonged to a woman who had died in a fire, along with her husband and two children, in the same house, ten years ago. Sam was a night manager at the Grand Hotel, a luxurious and historic place in the heart of the city. He loved his job, as he got to meet many interesting guests and enjoy the elegant atmosphere of the hotel. He also liked the fact that he had the hotel to himself at night, as most of the staff and guests were asleep. One night, he was doing his usual rounds, checking the security cameras and the locks on the doors. He noticed that one of the rooms on the fifth floor had its light on, even though it was supposed to be vacant. He decided to check it out, thinking that maybe someone had left it on by mistake. He took the elevator to the fifth floor and walked to the room. He knocked on the door and waited for a response. There was none. He tried the handle and found it unlocked. He opened the door and stepped inside. The room was dark, except for a dim lamp on the nightstand. He saw a bed, a dresser, a closet, and a window. He looked around and saw no sign of anyone. He walked to the window and looked outside. He saw the city lights and the moon. He felt a cold breeze on his face and realized that the window was open. He closed it and locked it. He turned around and saw something that made his blood run cold. There was a woman sitting on the bed, staring at him with a blank expression. She was pale and thin, with long black hair and dark eyes. She was wearing a white nightgown that was stained with blood. She had a large wound on her chest, where her heart should be. Sam felt a surge of fear and shock. He recognized the woman. She was Anna, a guest who had checked in a week ago. She had been found dead in her room, murdered by an unknown assailant. The police had taken her body and sealed off the room. How was she here, alive, or rather, undead? Sam wanted to scream, but he couldn't. He wanted to run, but he was frozen. He felt a strange force pulling him towards the woman. He tried to resist, but it was too strong. He felt like he was in a trance, unable to control his actions. He walked towards the woman, who smiled at him. She reached out her hand and touched his face. He felt a jolt of pain and saw a flash of images in his mind. He saw the woman's life, her joys and sorrows, her dreams and fears. He saw her check into the hotel, hoping for a relaxing vacation. He saw her meet a charming man at the bar, who invited her to his room. He saw her follow him, unaware of his true intentions. He saw him stab her in the heart, steal her valuables, and leave her to die. He saw her spirit linger in the room, unable to move on. 
He saw her loneliness and despair, her anger and hatred. He saw her desire for revenge. He also saw her plan. She wanted to use Sam as a vessel to possess his body and escape the hotel. She wanted to find her killer and make him pay. She wanted to live again, even if it meant killing Sam. Sam felt a wave of horror and pity. He realized that the woman was not evil, but tormented. He felt sorry for her, but he also valued his own life. He knew he had to break free from her grip before it was too late. He gathered all his willpower and pushed her away. He broke the contact and snapped out of the trance. He ran to the door and opened it. He ran out of the room and slammed the door behind him. He heard the woman scream and curse at him. He ignored her and ran to the elevator. He pressed the button and waited for it to arrive. He hoped it would be fast before the woman came after him. He breathed a sigh of relief when the elevator arrived. He got in and pressed the ground floor button. He felt the elevator move and hoped he was safe. He looked at the display and saw the numbers change. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. He heard a ding and the doors opened. He stepped out and saw the lobby. He saw the reception desk, the couches, the plants, and the paintings. He also saw the woman standing in front of him, smiling. She had followed him. Sam felt a surge of panic as he saw the woman in the lobby. He wondered how she had managed to get there so fast. He looked around and saw that there was no one else in sight. He was alone with her. He backed away from her, trying to find a way out. He saw the main entrance of the hotel, but it was locked. He saw the emergency exit, but it was blocked by a fire alarm. He saw the stairs, but they were too far away. He was trapped. The woman walked towards him, slowly and calmly. She looked like a ghost, with her pale skin, dark hair, and blood-stained gown. She spoke to him in a soft and eerie voice. Sam, don't be afraid. I don't want to hurt you. I just want to talk to you. You're the only one who can help me. Sam shook his head and tried to speak, but his voice was hoarse and weak. Help you? How can I help you? You're dead. You're a ghost. You tried to kill me. The woman smiled and shook her head. No, Sam, I didn't try to kill you. I tried to save you. You see, you're in danger. There's someone in this hotel who wants you dead. Someone who knows your secret. Someone who killed me. Sam felt a chill run down his spine. He wondered what she was talking about. He wondered what secret she knew. He wondered who killed her. Who are you talking about? Who killed you? Who wants me dead? The woman came closer to him and whispered in his ear. The man who stabbed me in the heart. The man who stole my valuables. The man who left me to die. The man who works at this hotel. The man who is your boss. The man who is the owner of the Grand Hotel. The man who is Mr. Grant. Sam gasped as he heard the woman's words. He couldn't believe what she was saying. Mr. Grant, his boss, the owner of the hotel, was her killer? And he wanted him dead too? Why? What did he do to him? He looked at the woman and saw a mix of emotions in her eyes. He saw sadness, anger, fear, and hope. He realized that she was telling the truth. She was not his enemy, but his ally. She was trying to warn him, to protect him, to help him. He felt a surge of gratitude and sympathy. He decided to trust her. He decided to help her. He nodded at her and said in a low voice, Thank you for telling me this. I'm sorry for what happened to you. I want to help you. I want to stop Mr. Grant. But how? How can we do that? The woman smiled and took his hand. She said in a whisper, Follow me. I have a plan. I know where he is. I know how to get to him. I know how to make him pay. Come with me, Sam. Let's end this. Let's end him. She led him to the stairs and they ran up to the sixth floor. They reached the door of Mr. Grant's suite. They opened it and entered. They saw Mr. Grant sitting on a couch, watching TV. 
He looked up and saw them. He recognized them. He was shocked. He was scared. He was doomed. The woman and Sam looked at each other and nodded. They knew what to do. They moved towards Mr. Grant, who tried to get up and run. But it was too late. They reached him and grabbed him. They held him down and stabbed him in the heart. They watched him bleed and die. They felt a sense of relief and justice. They had done it. They had avenged Anna. They had saved Sam. They hugged each other and smiled. They felt a connection, a bond, a love. They decided to leave the hotel together to start a new life. They walked out of the room, holding hands. They took the elevator to the ground floor. They exited the hotel and walked into the night. They were free. They were happy. They were alive.